tonight on CBC Vancouver News. TransLink simply doesn't care about the people of Metro Vancouver. This is on the union. Potential commuter chaos. Transit workers pledge to shut down our region's bus system next week if they can't reach a deal with their employer. Also, we want to just stop the groupism. Advocates say international students need more support. The call comes after three people were deported after several brawls in Surrey. And <laughs> honoring people lost to transphobic violence. The transgender flag is raised at the B.C. legislature for the first time. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Mike and Anita are away tonight. A nightmare scenario is looming for Metro Vancouver Transit users. A full shutdown of bus and sea bus service has been announced for next week. The CBC's Joel Ballard joins us live with more. Joel, what is this potential shutdown? Dan, to be clear, this isn't happening yet. It's the latest escalation in job action over contract negotiations between Coast Mountain Bus Company and transit workers. But if it does go ahead, it has the power to wreak havoc on Metro Vancouver's transit system. Holy mackerel, really? Whoa, La Bamba, I don't know. <laughs> Would it be, um, ooh, that, no bus service? Metro Vancouver's bus system could completely shut down. Suck a poopy. Well, I, I'm not too pumped up about that, I'll say that much. And that includes the sea bus. Solidarity! Sol, sol, sol! Solidarity! That pledge has now been made by transit workers. We will engage in a complete system shutdown on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of next week. No members of Unifor Local 111 and 2200 will report for work on those days. Potentially crippling lower mainland transit. I probably would not end up going to school or not end up going to work because I can't, I have no other transportation to get there. It's just more difficult to get anywhere. I need to drive more and I have to you know, think about it more. It's just all around not good. Coast Mountain Bus Company and parent company TransLink are angry. We are incredibly disappointed by the announced escalation of job action by the union today. This will have a devastating impact on this region. In particular, the 350,000 people who rely on the bus system every single weekday. Both sides pointing at each other. Ultimately, this is on the union. The blame lies squarely and fully with TransLink. At this point, the strike will only last for three days. The union says bus drivers will return to work the following Saturday. The job escalations follow months of negotiations and breakdowns. While both sides have made compromises, they're locked in a stare down over wages. But the province isn't planning on stepping in. For now. I'm encouraging both sides to get back to the bargaining table because that's where the deal will be made. Which means the union and the employer have six days to work out a new deal. If not, commuters can bank on transit chaos next Wednesday. All it does is confuse and make it hard on the person who has to take the bus. Dan, it should be noted that SkyTrain staff are represented by a completely different union and they're in the midst of their own contract negotiations. Now that union hasn't announced any plans for its own strike, but it's unclear whether SkyTrain staff would cross a picket line set up by transit workers next Wednesday. Back to you. Thank you very much. Joe Ballard reporting live for us tonight. Advocates say international students in BC need more support that call comes after three people were deported from Canada amid violent fights in Surrey. As John Hernandez reports, supporters say they're concerned international students are being unfairly labelled. This violent clash in the parking lot of a Surrey strip mall has taken up a lot of police time. Two videos have surfaced in three months showing mobs of young people fight and smash property. Surrey Mounties have been investigating these outbursts since March. 
About 50 people are involved. Some of them are international students. It was uh, a little bit disheartening. Right? Arvinder Singh Kang does outreach work with international students. He doesn't know how any got involved in these fights, but he says students can arrive in Canada and soon feel like outcasts. When you're bringing people from uh, different cultures, different uh, countries, um, there is a, uh, there, there is a certain idea of what it's going to be like being there, uh, but you know that orientation process doesn't exist as we know it. Oh, no, no, no. Police have deported three young people and three may soon be removed, though it's not clear if any are students. But this immigration lawyer says student visas can be quickly revoked. Non-citizens of Canada can be removed without a criminal charge or a conviction. And while the police have said that many of the students in this mob are Canadians, advocates say the incident has fueled negative comments targeting international students online. It sends a message to the community that these guys, they create a nuisance and then they get more problems like finding accommodations and then coming to a different country. It, it, like, it really gets that bridge, uh, that, that gap more open. We need to get away from scapegoating. We need to get away from witch hunting. Uh, we need to open more dialogue. To break the stigma, these former students say schools and governments need to do a better job making newcomers feel at home. There is a need for, uh, you know, for, for, for a legislative change as well, which starts focusing a little bit more on the, uh, you know, on the needs of the students. Surrey RCMP say they are working with international student groups to help educate more young people. John Hernandez, CBC News, Surrey. We have some sad news to share with you tonight in the world of Canadian music. John Mann, the lead singer of Spirit of the West, has died. You have to excuse me, I'm not at my best. There's John building out one of the group's signature hits, Home for a Rest. Mann fronted the Canadian folk rock group for more than a quarter century. He was also a songwriter and actor with a career spanning nearly 40 years. In 2014, Mann was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. Even though the band retired in 2016, they still played benefit concerts to bring awareness to his disease. John Mann was 57 years old. Vancouver police are asking for your help to solve what they're calling a suspicious apartment fire on the south side of the city. Several people had to be rescued from their balconies early yesterday morning as flames ripped through this complex. Firefighters used ladders to rescue four people after thick smoke in the halls forced them outside. Two other people were found overcome with smoke in the hallways. One of them, a 33-year-old man, is still in hospital with serious injuries. The information that we have from our investigation is that the fire started outside of the apartment building and then spread inside. We have witnesses who have told us that they heard fireworks, and we have witnesses who saw people walking away. Police say it's not yet clear whether the fire was deliberately set or not. VPD's major crime section is investigating along with Vancouver firefighters. An historic day in our province's capital. The transgender flag was raised at the B.C. Legislature today for the very first time. The flag was raised to mark Transgender Day of Remembrance. That day was founded in 1999 as a way to honor people who have been killed or murdered because of transphobia. More than 300 trans people have been killed around the world this year alone. Most of them are trans women of color. I look forward to the day when trans people, non-binary people, two-spirit people, anyone who is gender diverse can live with the respect and the acceptance and the inclusion that cisgender people enjoy every day. The province has taken several steps toward inclusion, including teaching gender identity in schools, providing non-binary non gender options on government identification and improving access to gender-affirming surgeries. It was one year ago today the two top provincial officials were marched out of the B.C. legislature, sparking a spending scandal that would shake the B.C. government. Our Legislative Bureau Chief Tanya Fletcher sat down with a man whose bombshell allegations began at all. Here's part of her interview today with Speaker of the House Daryl Plekis. So it's been exactly one year since the two senior officials were suspended here. Uh, looking back over the past year, what are your overall thoughts? I wish it was over by now. I wish we weren't talking a first anniversary, but there's still lots to do. The police investigation is still very, very active. Uh, so there, there's more coming. It's called attention, this whole issue. 
uh, to the need to have better safeguards in place, better oversight, uh, better controls, uh, and, all, and all of that's being put in place as we speak. Looking back now, the clerk and the sergeant at arms have both since quit in the past year. You're the last man standing. How does that feel? I mean, given the circumstances, I can appreciate why they would have, why they would have chosen to resign. Uh, I'm not sure uh, it's all over for either of them. Uh, in fact, I'm, sh I'm sure it's not. Uh, there, there's, there's still more that they're, they're going to have to answer for. But I would be very surprised if there weren't charges within a year. Looking forward, you mentioned that there's more to come. Are we talking in the way of whistleblowers coming forward? Is that what you meant? Certainly whistleblowers have come forward. And some of these people's lives have been turned completely upside down. You can imagine you don't work somewhere for 25 years and somebody says you're out of a job without it being catastrophic. Looking back on the past year, is there anything you would have done differently? It's, it's not so much what I have done anything differently. Uh, I wouldn't have done anything differently. I don't think my chief of staff would have done anything differently. And our Tanya Fletcher is live for us in Victoria at the legislature with more. Tanya, year flies by pretty fast. You also spoke to former Sergeant at Arms Gary Lenz today. What did he tell you? Dan, he says it's been a year from hell. He says he's done nothing wrong and he's confident he will ultimately be cleared. So Gary Lenz spoke uh, quite candidly with me over the phone for about half an hour today. And he remembers in great detail the day he was marched out of this building under police escort and under a cloud of confusion. He notes he didn't even know what the accusations against him were specifically until several months later when Speaker Daryl Plekis released his report. Now, you have to remember there were two independent reports that were done separately after that one of them by Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin, and she essentially cleared Lens of any wrongdoing. But we confirmed today that his law firm has now submitted a $50,000 invoice to the Legislative Assembly for his legal defense stemming from that report, and that is within policy that essentially taxpayers pay for that. Uh, there was also the Doug Lepard report. He was a consultant's commission to look into the actions of Gary Lenz, and it basically found or claimed that uh, Lenz lied in Beverly McLaughlin's report. Today, uh, Gary Lenz said that he strongly disagrees with that. He says he did not lie to Beverly McLaughlin. Uh, he, I asked him what his involvement with the RCMP has been in, in regards to their investigation. He says he's only spoken with them once. That was when they initially asked for his statement several months ago in the summer. He also says, I asked him about his relationship with former clerk Craig James. He says they have not maintained a relationship and he last spoke with him in the summer. So where do we go from here? We still have that ongoing RCMP investigation with the assistance of two special prosecutors. The speaker is confident criminal charges will result from that. And today, as we heard from Gary Lenz, he's confident he will be cleared in that. So two very different opinions there. We also reached out to uh, Clerk Craig James, former Clerk Craig James, for comment, and he did not provide a response. Dan. Thank you, Tanya. Legislative Bureau Chief Tanya Fletcher reporting from Victoria. Well, still at the legislature, the province announced today it will not appeal a key court ruling involving ICBC cases. The government had tried to limit the use of medical experts in settlements, but the B.C. Supreme Court recently ruled that was unconstitutional. Attorney General David Eby says instead of challenging that decision, the province will introduce amendments to the Evidence Act in the spring to set new limits. By pursuing these amendments in the spring, we expect to achieve some future savings for litigants in our court system, including ICBC. We hope to reduce costs for personal injury plaintiffs to help, keep them, help them keep more of their settlements, instead of seeing that money go to pay for excessive and expensive adversarial expert reports. The limit on expert reports was projected to save taxpayers $400 million. UBC is scrambling to ensure its exchange students in Hong Kong are safe amid those violent clashes between police and pro-democracy protesters can drag on. Now, none of the students attend Polytechnic University, where protesters are holed up amid a police siege most of UBC's 31 students in the region have already left. Of those who remain, six have confirmed plans to leave, three are staying with family, and two are still working on travel plans. All departing students have been offered emergency bursaries to help with any expenses. The Hong Kong police are still surrounding the university, where about 100 protesters now remain.
That's down from the thousand or so young people who were barricaded there since Sunday. Some tried to escape through a sewer but have been arrested. And as Greg Rasmussen tells us from Hong Kong, others have come out on their own risking the consequences. Some of the protesters who had been behind barricades at a Hong Kong university had to be carried out while others walked out on their own. They left behind this, once a stronghold, now one of several universities where classes have been cancelled indefinitely. Like this protester vow to fight until the end, while others have had enough and are desperate to leave. I've attended uh, twice yesterday and today, but it's in vain. Yeah, um, I'm a bit upset. Police have been seen viciously beating some people during arrests, but officials are offering new protections. We will accompany you to the police station to make sure that the whole case is going to be processed peacefully, uh, fairly, and humanistically. Last night, police kept a tight grip on the university, but there were no new clashes. It's descended into a tense standoff with a heavy police presence out here on the perimeter and about 100 protesters inside refusing to give up. There are also fresh allegations of abuse of force, including complaints from a former British consulate employee living in Hong Kong. He alleges being tortured and questioned about the protests while on a trip to mainland China. I've been shackled, I've been handcuffed, and I've been blindfolded, and then they start to torture, for example, like to put my hands up, handcuff, and for several hours. The Chinese Communist Party and All of which led to fresh warnings from countries including Britain and the United States about the need to protect the rights of those living in Hong Kong. Complaints which were quickly rebuffed by Chinese officials saying this is an internal matter. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Hong Kong. Meteorologist Brett Soderholm is here for our first check of the weather. Kept it pretty simple today. Sunny, crisp. <laughs> Take it away. Honestly, simple is sometimes just the best. All of that sunshine was great, and I personally enjoyed needing to take my sunglasses out, as opposed to any rain jacket, any rain boots, none of that. We are going to be keeping this trend going, but in addition to all that sunshine, it helped make BC once again the warmest province in the country. No real surprise there, but could you guess where the warmest spot was? Oh, that would be good old Abbotsford. 12.5 degrees today was the high, and White Rock, just off the screen there, almost barely, that was very close behind at about 12.3. So no other province even came close to that. Temperatures now, though, of course, have taken a bit of a dive with that sun setting a little bit earlier and no real clouds to speak of in the sky. That's going to keep these temperatures where they're at, if not actually much cooler for the next little while. Let's talk about that a little bit, because as always, under these clear sky conditions, we get into this point where the temperatures Temperatures will be the dominant story. And again, places traditionally like Surrey, New West, Richmond, we could see lows tonight going down to about the freezing mark. And even in Vancouver, toward more so the downtown core, I wouldn't be surprised to see those drop actually down to about two degrees. But if you've been enjoying the sun, if that's something that you're liking as much as I am, well, tomorrow should not disappoint in any way, shape, or form. Still a really chilly start to the day, so definitely keep those mitts handy and a warm jacket. But by the afternoon, plenty of sunshine. And again, temperatures 9, 10 degrees. It's going to be great, so looking forward to it. I think it will be. Thank you very much, You're Mr. Welcome. Sutterholm. A confusing fight about who owns an $18 million parking lot in East Vancouver has escalated into a lawsuit. The city holds the title to this property, but Aura Ventures Corporation, which owns eight properties backing onto this lot, say there's much more to it. In the notice of claim, Aura says it and other local commercial property owners are the true owners of the lot, because decades ago, near my merchants got a loan from the city to acquire and develop the land. And they eventually paid that loan off. Fast forward to this June, and the city announcing plans to build a women's housing project and daycare on the site. That's when this dispute got messy. The matter is now before the courts. To Abbotsford now, where parents say something must be done about a foul odor that's seeping into their children's school. The stench wafting over King Traditional Elementary is from a poultry farm and litter storage facility across the road. The smell first appeared two years ago. The school has carbon filters installed to help ease the stench. But after several complaints, BC's Environment Ministry handed 93 Land Company, which operates the farm and that facility, a fine. 
Earlier this year, the company put in practices to reduce the odor during school hours. But parents say it's back, and so bad, it's making some people sick. Kids are throwing up before getting onto the bus. Uh, teachers are talking about going home with migraines from work. You get a gag reflex. It's so beyond pungent, and people say, you know, it's just a farm smell. It's not a farm smell. It's a different smell, and it's a toxic smell. 93 Land Company says it has taken steps to address the parents' concerns, and it's actively looking for ways to improve its operations to minimize the impact on its neighbors. A reminder, you can watch this newscast live on our app, CBC Gem. It's free and is also where you can find our other CBC programs. CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau unveiled his new cabinet this morning in Ottawa. Four BC MPs are on the list. We'll tell you about the cabinet shuffle after this. Thank you for joining us online during our regu regularly scheduled TV commercial break. We're always ad-free on this live stream. This next story is a good reminder to never lose your sense of adventure. The CBC's Guy Kenville introduces us to a 60-year-old who's out to prove that visual impairment ought not to stop you from getting out and enjoying fresh air this winter. Ron Walsh's vision started failing when he was 27. At 60, he's now totally blind. He still likes to be active though, cross-country skiing and hiking, and he wants other blind people to get out too. I noticed that in certain clubs and that, I'm the only blind person involved, where some of those things like the canoe club and hiking and doing stuff like this, that's just designed for people that are blind. It's, uh, physical fitness is a very good thing. It uh, blows off stress, it makes you feel better, you sleep better. It's, it's a very important part of your life where a lot of people that are blind don't have that physical exertion. That's why Walsh has launched Blind Adventurer. He wants to pair blind people with sighted volunteers who will help guide the blind on outdoor excursions and get their heart rates up. Walsh has succeeded here before. In 2017, with the help of his friend and guide Tyler Matheson, Walsh hiked the Chilkoot Trail from Alaska to BC, all 53 kilometers of it. The pair practiced by hiking over boulders by a Saskatoon bridge. I told Ron for, for quite a while I wasn't going to go with him. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't confident that he would be able to do it safely or that I'd be able to get him through it safely. Uh, but I ended up doing some trials in Saskatoon and taking him to some areas that I thought might be able to uh, test his skills, and I was satisfied that he could do it. And when we went, it was great. Uh, Ron is uh, he's pretty much Rubbermaid. Monique Lalonde joined Walsh for a recent hike north of Saskatoon. Blind from birth, Lalonde was very active growing up on a farm, but not so much once she got to university. It did become more, more challenging because it was so much simpler to isolate myself or to find people who didn't really care about being active. Um, blind or sighted, uh, I had some sighted friends that just, it was more fun to play video games and sit in front of a TV than it is to get out here. Walsh's hope is to attract more volunteers and get groups out for a hike and a repeat canoe trip next year. Guy Kenville, CBC News, Saskatoon. We'll be back with more news on CBC Vancouver in just a few moments. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau made some major changes to his cabinet this morning. Four BC members of parliament are on the list, but the pressure on one is particularly heavy. Harjit Sajjan will remain as Minister of National Defence. Joyce Murray, the MP for Vancouver Quadra, is going to be the new digital Minister for Digital Government. And Delta MP Carla Qualtro has been moved to the Ministry of Employment, Workforce Development and Disability Inclusion. But North Vancouver MP Jonathan Wilkinson's promotion from fisheries to the environment is a major change, one that puts him squarely under the microscope.
He's definitely going to be on the hot seat here, so he, uh, his role here is going to be ensuring that uh, environmental policy for the government uh, is pushed forward uh, at the same time that the government is trying to push forward on Trans Mountain Pipeline, an issue that he is on record supporting. And so there's going to be a lot of scrutiny and a certain amount of skepticism, I think, coming in, and he's going to have to, to work hard to try to convince Canadians that are looking for a strong environmental policy that this government is going to stay the course on that, uh, on that uh, portfolio. The CBC's David Cochran is in Ottawa tonight with a breakdown on more of who is in, who is out, and the other big shifts in the new 37-person cabinet. Justin Trudeau starts his second term a little bit older. <laughs> and perhaps a little wiser after voters handed him a minority. I'm very excited today. Uh, to be able to uh, get down to work the way Canadians uh, asked us to in this last election, uh, to pull together the country. Trudeau is relying heavily on two senior ministers to do just that, most notably the new deputy prime minister. Today I think Canadians appreciate that we face some big challenges at home. Those challenges are evident in a family photo with no Alberta or Saskatchewan MPs. So Freeland will lead a Western response team that includes Dan Van Dow, a rookie minister from Manitoba, Jonathan Wilkinson, an environment minister from British Columbia, and Seamus O'Regan, a natural resources minister from Newfoundland and Labrador. Jim Carr, too sick to sit in cabinet, will be a special advisor on prairie issues. I think what we need to do as a federal government when it comes to the West and when it comes to all our provincial relationships is really listen hard. Pablo Rodriguez will be listening hard to the opposition. As House leader in a minority parliament, he needs the votes of other parties to pass legislation. I'm comfortable to working with, with everybody. I mean, at the end of the day, we're elected by Canadians. Rodriguez is also Trudeau's Quebec lieutenant, a position that does not exist in any other province. But with Quebec's premier flexing considerable political muscles, Trudeau needs someone to deal directly with Francois Legault. And while Freeland is known around the world, world, she has no political network in Quebec. I continue to be a proud Quebecer, but I will be uh, very much engaged on issues of national importance as well as uh, issues facing various provinces. And uh, having Pablo uh, at my side on engaging with Quebec will be a, a very useful thing for us all. Trudeau took a month to put his team together. Their work starts now on many fronts. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Another day of explosive testimony in Washington at the House impeachment inquiry. This time, the American ambassador to the EU was in the hot seat and revealed details about feeling pressured by the White House. That's next.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We will engage in a complete system shutdown on Wednesday, Thursday and Friday of next week. There is very limited action that we can realistically take when you're facing a complete system shutdown. Metro Vancouver's bus system could be on ice next week. Transit workers are threatening a three-day shutdown if they can't reach a deal with Coast Mountain Bus Company. TransLink insists it has made a generous offer to the union. Hundreds of thousands of commuters could be stuck if the shutdown goes ahead. We need to get away from skateboarding. We need to get away from witch hunting. Supporters of international students say they need more support and less targeting. The call comes after three people were deported amid violent brawls in Surrey. It's not clear if those removed from Canada are students, but advocates say they're concerned they're being unfairly labeled. You have to excuse me. I'm not and Canada has lost a music icon. John Mann, the boisterous singer of Spirit of the West, has died. He was 57. Mann was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's in 2014, but still continued to perform. It has been another gripping day in Washington, D.C. The U.S. ambassador to the European Union gave explosive testimony at the House impeachment inquiry today. Gordon Sondland says he pressured Ukraine to look into Donald Trump's political rival, Joe Biden. As the CBC's Katie Simpson explains, Sondland says he did it at the president's, quote, express direction. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony... Armed with emails and details, the president's top man in Europe flipped on his boss. I was acting in good faith. As a presidential appointee, I followed the directions of the president. U.S. Ambassador to the EU Gordon Sondland confirmed he was part of a ploy to pressure the Ukrainians to launch an investigation into the 2016 election and Democratic rival Joe Biden and his son. Everyone was in the loop. It was no secret. The president's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, was leading the charge, Sondland said, adding U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo knew, as did acting White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney, Vice President Mike Pence, and former National Security Advisor John Bolton. Now, in your opening statement, you confirm that there was a quid pro quo. Correct. And, in fact, you say that other senior officials in the State Department and the Chief of Staff's office, including Mick Mulvaney, Secretary Pompeo, we're aware of this quid pro quo that in order to get the White House meeting, there were going to have to be these investigations the president wanted. Correct. Republicans tried to poke president holes Biden. in Sondland's claims, highlighting a direct Biden. conversation he had with Trump in early September when the president Senate specifically denied he wanted a quid pro quo. And you believe the president, correct? You know what? I'm not going to characterize whether I believed or didn't believe. I was just trying to convey what he said on the phone. But here's my response. Trump seized on this, refuting the testimony by reading from prepared notes. I say to the ambassador in response, I want nothing. I want nothing. I want no quid pro quo. Tell Zelensky, President Zelensky, to do the right thing. Republicans appeared unaware Sondland was going to turn on Trump. In opening comments, they praised him. But by the end of the hearings, they tried to discredit him as someone who didn't take notes and wasn't very involved. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Democrats insist Sondland's testimony advances the case for impeachment. But not surprisingly, Republicans have their own take. Susan Ormiston shows us how they're spinning it as harmless, starting with the president himself. Ready with his take, President Trump had but one headline for his audience. You have the cameras rolling? I want nothing. That's what I want from Ukraine. That's what I said. I want nothing. I said it twice. With bold note, Trump restated what he told Gordon Sondland on the phone, repeating it six times here in a minute. Now, if you weren't fake news, you'd cover it properly. I say to the ambassador in response, I want nothing, I want nothing, I want no quid pro quo. That is what Sondland testified, except he said a lot more, that he understood explicitly President Trump did want something, investigations, but used Rudy Giuliani as a foil and that the president's top men were in the loop. 
By noon, even Fox News concluded that Trump had a Gordon problem. Uh, to a certain degree, took out the bus and he ran over President Trump, Vice President Pence, Mike Pompeo, John Bolton, Rudy Giuliani, Mick Mulvaney. Sondland said he kept U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo informed at every stage and was told that Giuliani was the gatekeeper for Ukraine. In Brussels for NATO meetings, Pompeo sidestepped. Yeah, I didn't see a single thing that I was working. Sounds like you might not have been. Uh, I, I was in meetings all day and haven't had a chance to see any of, of that testimony. Sondland has twice refreshed what he remembered in his testimony. Republicans characterized him as a businessman turned diplomat who is now trying to protect himself. President Trump touring an apple plant in Texas had his own conclusions. Not only did we win today, it's over. It's not, but a Gallup poll out today showed the president's approval rating ticking back up two points to 43 percent, the same as in mid-September before a whistleblower or any impeachment inquiry. And that has to be worrying Democrats, hoping that testimony like today changes minds. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. Now to a scandal across the proverbial pond. Prince Andrew is doing something members of the royal family rarely do. He's stepping away from public life. But as Margaret Evans tells us, it follows a disastrous interview his PR person told him not to do. We go inside Buckingham. It wasn't getting any better for Prince Andrew, far from it. And today he bowed to the inevitable. The Queen's favoured son, allegedly, increasingly out of favour with charities and corporate sponsors lining up to drop him after that ill-fated interview about Jeffrey Epstein. Do I regret the fact that, that, that he has quite obviously conducted himself in a manner unbecoming? Yes. Unbecoming? He was a sex offender? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm being polite. And so, from Buckingham Palace tonight, a resignation letter of sorts. The Duke of York announcing he'll step back from public duties for the foreseeable future, with the Queen's permission. I can't think of someone who's committed reputation suicide quite so fundamentally and so publicly ever. John Arledge, who has interviewed the Prince, says he isn't surprised. He is arrogant. He is entitled. He has a rather generous assessment of his own intellect. And with Britain in the midst of an election campaign, his troubles even made it into the leaders' debate last night. Is the monarchy fit for purpose? Jeremy Corbyn. Needs a bit of improvement. <laughs> Mr Johnson. The institution of the monarchy is beyond reproach. But the Duke of York clearly is not. In an apparent act of contrition, he said tonight he will do more than merely consider requests by U.S. prosecutors eager to question him about his friendship with Epstein. Cooperating with the investigation would be, be the absolute least he could do. Rehabilitation in the public eye, though, could be a long time coming. As for the Queen, she's clearly hoping to return to business as usual out performing her own public duties on a day that also happens to be her 72nd wedding anniversary. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. There's a live shot of a greenish science world, a mainly sunny day today, nice and crisp, and the sun is sticking around, but not for the weekend. Brett will tell us why not, coming up.
A new front has opened up as Australia battles to contain wildfires across several states. Dozens of new blazes have started in the country's south, and thousands are preparing to evacuate as flames destroy hundreds of homes. We don't take seven catastrophic fire danger warnings lightly. That is as bad as it gets. Worst we've ever seen. Never seen anything like this. About a million hectares of farmland and bush have been scorched. The conditions have worsened, fueled in part by hot weather and strong winds. More than 100 schools were closed as crews fight blazes and monitor new fires across the country. Particularly hard hit are the eastern states of New South Wales and Queensland, where the severity of the fires is prompting fresh concerns about the effects of climate change. Pretty dramatic example of that. Yeah, I, I would certainly say so. Unbelievable. And these are just the series after however many years of fires they've had. Done right. There. And even listening to some locals' perspectives on mm -hmm. this, thinking that for them this is the worst that they've seen in recent memory, that says a lot right there. Sure does. So it is downright terrifying. Absolutely. Very different scenario for us Very here. Very different. We are dry. Fortunately, mm -hmm. nothing is on fire as far as I Thank know, God. which is great. But uh, yeah, that dry conditions, or those dry conditions at least, that is going to be lasting right through the work week. But maybe not much longer than that. I want to show you a live shot right now of a place that may be a little bit dear to me. This is good old science world, of Ooh. course. It's a very clear night right now, so no real rain to be showing you or anything like that. But you can see the little sphere there lit up quite nicely with some green lights. And what's actually quite interesting is that the sky itself here across BC may be doing that naturally. We're talking about the Aurora Borealis or the Northern Lights. Now this map, it's a little bit hard to read. I, I definitely admit that, but all across the province, we are gonna be seeing at least a chance of potentially catching these Northern Lights in action tonight, mostly clear skies. So if you're gazing anywhere between 10 at night tonight to two o'clock in the morning, look up, there might be a chance you'll catch a little dance of some of those Northern Lights. Now it will be a bit chilly tonight, as you know, so do bring a little bit of an extra layer if you're gonna be doing that. But tomorrow, we're gonna be repeating largely what we experienced today. So it's going to be a mostly sunny day, temperatures close to seasonal or slightly above. So really enjoy it. It's going to be great. And this is all thanks again to this area of high pressure. It's been our friend for the past little while, but it's going to be taking a little bit of a back burner for the next little while. It's going to be allowing this moisture from the Pacific to come on shore, and that's going to lead to more rain falling in the northwestern portions of the province by this week, by the end of the week rather. And then for us, it's going to be a bit of a weekend story. I'm going to walk you through here in terms of the timing. Again, this is really subject to change. It's a really tough forecast for this, but I do believe that if we're going to be seeing any showers this weekend, it's going to be on Saturday. This is not an all-day rain event. It's not like what we saw last Saturday, but certainly a few showers would be expected there. But Sunday, at this point in time, maybe a few showers first thing in the morning, but beyond that, it's actually going to be clearing up quite nicely. And in terms of our five-day forecast for this, it's looking very close to seasonal for our temperatures. So again, that would be about eight degrees right now for Vancouver, and we're going to be seeing that consistently for the next little while, keeping in mind, of course, our overnight lows on the chillier side, maybe even down to the freezing mark for some. And again, it's not that I personally like telling you that it's going to rain on the weekend. It certainly <laughs> just seems like this more often than not when I'm up here. But be prepared for at least a few showers come Saturday. Your humility inspires us all. Thank you. <laughs> A century-old cornerstone of Prince George is preparing to shut its doors in the new year. Coming up, we're going to take you to Northern Hardware and hear from the owner and the locals about what they're going to miss most. Stick around.
I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Your favorite holiday tradition is back. It's CBC Radio Canada's 33rd Annual Open House and Food Bank Day on December 6th. Join me and your favorite CBC personalities at 700 Hamilton Street for live broadcasts, musical performances, and tours of the newsroom. Last year, we raised over $800,000 for local food banks across BC. A central piece of Prince George's downtown identity is closing down. After 100 years in business, the Northern, a hardware and furniture store, is liquidating. This store's been in here for since I've grown up. It's kind of a shame to see it shutting down. Like with my wife's dad, he used to be a customer and a regular customer. And every time he'd come in, they'd like serve him just right off the bat. The store wasn't just limited to hardware and furniture, though, and its merchandise drew people downtown. In February, though, the locally owned hardware store will close for good. Kelly Green's great-grandfather opened the Northern. She's worked there since she was 16. A lot of emotions, a lot of wow, can't believe it's happening. Um, it's a loss. It, it, it is a loss, especially for downtown Prince George. But I'm choosing, we are choosing to focus on, you know, the good, like 100 years. It's a, it's a great way to end. Like I said, everything has a lifespan, and Northern's lived its life. About 30 people are going to lose their jobs after liquidation sales in the new year. Green says online shopping is mostly to blame for declining sales. Secondhand shopping is back in style again. Some consumers do it for the thrill of that hunt, others for the cheaper price tag. But a new report shows more Canadians are buying used clothing because of the impact fast fashion is having on our environment. The CBC's Diane Buckner explains. I think I only have one item in here that's new. Sophie Robertson is proud that almost her entire wardrobe is secondhand. This was secondhand, these were secondhand. I think they had never been worn before. She used to shop at fast fashion chains like Zara and H&M, but no more. I don't want to be a part of, you know, polluting the planet. We have so much out there already. Shopping secondhand to save money has always been popular, but now concern for the environment is a growing factor. Clothing waste is like one of the biggest pollutants, so this is obviously helping because we're not buying more new clothes. Mm -hmm. According to a recent survey, there's a shift underway in Canadian attitudes. Classified advertising website Kijiji has just released its fifth annual report on the secondhand economy. It asks survey participants about what motivates them, and this year cost is down 4%, while altruistic and ecological reasons are up by 6%. When I was growing up, it was, you know, not, not as cool to wear secondhand clothing. And this district well. manager at Value Village says sales are growing. The stigma of shopping at thrift stores is fading. It represented people not having the money to, to spend on new clothing. That was probably the stigma around it, but it's completely different now. Even online retailers of used clothing have sprung up. Poshmark and ThreadUp are both American companies that have expanded to Canada. We've been seeing the secondhand market since we started doubling. The co-founder of ThreadUp was in Toronto recently to speak at a conference. It's going to double again in the next uh, 10 years. Chris it Homer says in terms of growth, used clothing sellers are clobbering regular retail. The fact that we're seeing secondhand growing at a 16% oh, year over year, doubling every five to 10 years rate, that's just not something, that's just a completely different trend shift that's happening within the, the market. Unique styles, bargains, and a clear conscience in terms of climate change, it's a winning combination for a growing group of consumers. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. The Grammy nominations were announced today. Included on the list are several Canadian artists, including one well-known local crooner. There he is. More after this.
On the early edition, Fraser Health is hosting a workshop at a Surrey High School for parents concerned about their children vaping. We are going to hear from them about tips about how to talk to your children. Michael Bublé has earned yet another accolade on his long list of musical accomplishments. The BC born crooner was nominated for a Grammy this morning. And he wasn't alone. There are a few other Canadian artists, including some you may have heard of, named Drake and Sean Mendez. Well, CBC's Tashauna Reed has more on this year's nominations. Truth hurts, Lizzo. You need to calm down, Taylor Swift. As the first category of Grammy nominees were announced, one observation from the Grammy's new president. It's a lot of women. Lot Just of women. saying. Okay. <laughs> Leading the way, singer-rapper Lizzo. Known for hits like Truth Hurts, Lizzo received eight Grammy nominations, from Song of the Year to Best New Artist. Quite the feat for one of music's newest faces. But the newcomer will face some fierce competition. Other fresh faces in music who had their share of number one hits this year. This is really hard. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So you're a tough guy, like you're really a rough guy. Tied with six nominations each, 17 year old bad guy singer Billie Eilish made Grammy history as the youngest artist to ever be nominated in top Grammy categories. I got the horses in the bag. And 20-year-old Little Nas X, whose song Old Town Road was a breakout sensation. Today's announcement was also a big moment for some Canadians. You don't gotta tell me about your body count. Toronto R&B singer Jesse Reyes earned her first ever Grammy nod for her seven-track album, Being Human in Public, which is up for Best Urban Contemporary Album. When I fall in love. And BC jazz crooner Michael Bublé's album of cover songs, Love, is up for an award. <laughs> Alberta singing group Northern Cree received its ninth career Grammy nomination for Best Regional Roots Music Album. See how you did, homeboy, please take it easy. And some well-known Canadians were recognized for their collaborative efforts with other artists, including Drake, who leads the Canadian nominees with two nods for features on songs. I love it when you call as well as Ontario singers Sean Mendez and Daniel Caesar. Winners will be announced at the Grammy Awards hosted by R&B singer Alicia Keys on January 26th. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. Call this the ship shipping ships. Can you say that five times fast? I would prefer not to. Okay. Well, two new hybrid electric BC ferries are heading to our province from a very long way away. The island-class vessels have been loaded onto a very large semi-submersible transport ship in Romania. It sinks partially in the water so the two ferries can be loaded up. Now they'll travel more than 10,000 nautical miles right here to BC. They are expected to arrive in 40 to 45 days and eventually get pushed by tug to Victoria. BC Ferry says the two ships are battery equipped and designed to run fully electric. They'll be put on the Powell River, Texada Island, and Port McNeil Alert Bay, so Tula routes next year. Very cool viz. Yeah, that mm -hmm. is impressive. I also mm -hmm. had no idea that we would ship something from that far away over to here, because when you're really that on the other side of the world, mm -hmm. you could go through the Panama Canal to get up the coast of BC, or you might as well just go off to Singapore. But I think you said this one. Yes, I, and that would be via Suez? Suez Canal, yeah. Suez Canal, there we go. So this one is going through the Panama Canal. Right, so it's impressive. Wait to see how that goes. Absolutely. There's your geography <laughs> lesson for the night, folks. Always need it. You can always find our news program online at cbc.ca slash bc. Our next local news is right here at 11 o'clock with Tina Lovegreen tonight after the National. We'll leave you now with some photos of our Maggie Robinson took of a massive chandelier that's going up under the Granville Street Bridge as part of a permanent public art piece. Beautiful, isn't it? Have a great night.